Break, break, well, good evening, everybody. We're back, break, back on the air with part two of uh, Ricky Ruiz. So, so we're talking about Larry Dixon with that double seater now. You mean Ricky Raccoon? Well, my wife calls you Ricky Raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> anybody named Ricky? Uh, yeah, anybody named Ricky, she calls him Ricky Raccoon. <laughs> so yeah, the Larry Dixon's got that double seat night show top viewer drag series that. You know, ten thousand dollars. Anybody can ride in that thing and have the experience of a lifetime. Yeah, I, I, I think if you can get a full pass, you know, uh, in a nitro car, ten thousand dollars is, is a small price to pay. And and I, I can say that because look at all the money I spent to go nitro racing. If or any nitro racer, if you can get that, if you can get that thrill and that feeling in in, in a nitro car, and what. What uh, what that ten thousand dollars probably goes back into that car, you know, to maintain it. Uh, a few years back, when Anton Brown, you know, flipped two of Schumacher's cars, you know, and I'm not blaming Anton Brown. He he, he was the writer on uh, two crashes. And they interviewed uh, Don Schumacher, you know, about it being an expensive year for him. He told he told the the announcer at that time. It cost him twenty thousand dollars per pass per car to make a quarter, or, well, a thousand foot pass. You know, twenty grand. So if you can get a ride at Larry's car for ten grand, two things. I know it's tuned down, but it still it still probably goes through the the same uh, maintenance because that car uh, runs, you know, right. pretty big. You know, from what I've seen. All right, so now, Ricky, when you when you drag race, did you have any uh, pre race rituals or superstitions when you raced? Well, you know, I never had any superstitions. But uh, my family and and my crew guys, we all come to circle and 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 set a prayer for protection. You know, for myself and and anybody around the car and any the fans and stuff. And and that that, that ritual is is something that we did. At every race, every path, everywhere, no matter what. And uh, but I, I'm not a superstitious guy. Uh, you you got to understand some of the first cars in my early years, some of the cars that I built, I, I look at them, and if I had crashed, I wouldn't be living today. Those those cars would not survive any kind of a crash. You know, I mean, we, we just didn't know any better, and and we didn't have the equipment, and uh, you know, so so. Once, once I got into a professional car, even some of the experiences I, I've been through, uh, always felt safe in that car. And like I said, that, that car, that car sits in my trailer today. It's, it's ready to run. If, if it was recertified, everything was recertified, but it, it's physically, mechanically ready to run. And, uh, that chassis took me through, uh, uh, 30 years of racing, almost 30 years of racing. You know, so I felt comfortable. So, w- what would you consider to be your most most uh, memorable race ever? You know, there's so many of them that are memorable. Uh, I gotta say, the most memorable. Well, I'll tell you, winning winning the. Uh, Budweiser Fuel Altered Classic in Tucson one year with 14 AA fuel cars, the best in the country on the West Coast, was there. It was extremely memorable. Um, but winning the uh, the Night Fire in Boise, Idaho, real big race to be in that fuel altered race. Winning that one uh, was was very, very uh, memorable because we tried for years. You know, we just wanted to win that race. That, that was that's where all the big cars show up. Uh, the purse was always good. Uh, the fans are great. I mean, they have a tremendous turnout. It's just a fun race. And uh, you always want to be good for your fans. You know, it, it, it's funny. Is, is when you're racing, when you don't do good, you feel like you, you've let your crew and your fans down. You know, it's not, it's not really about you. Uh, you know, you just don't want to let the people around that, that uh, you know, rooting for you. Right. And uh, so I, I would say that. But 
But I got to tell you, racing up in Alaska, you know, we raced in Alaska six times. And in fact, my final uh, strike race, I called that, was in Alaska. And racing up there, uh, uh, we raced every year on Fourth of July weekend. And every year, those races were very, very memorable. And, and the whole trip, you know, the, uh, from the time we left, we left our shop till the time we got back uh, was memorable, you know, tr- travel. Uh, but, but the races up there, and we always ran again, you know, up there too. Yep. But, uh, so racing in Alaska, was it cold up there when you raced? Uh, well, it was usually in the 70s. And, and uh, interestingly, 4th of July was when we would race. And uh, prior to that, you know, I had a pretty busy schedule. And we got called, uh, 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 Jerry Bodenstadt had put a race together for us. He owned, you know, uh, some of his dad, Gary, and the family owned the Rock and Group. We got raced to Walter. So they invited us up to do a match race with them. Well, I had raced in, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, one week. Then the next week, I raced out in Fallon, Nevada. Tucson was 110 degrees. It was, I think, 102 degrees out in Fallon. It was in the 100 plus. And then we got in, we went up to Alaska, and we raced in 70 degree weather. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going back to Tucson anymore in the middle of the summer. So, no, it was never cold. Uh, we did get some rain from time to time, uh, but it was warm rain. So what you, what you have to remember, Dave, you know, in the summertime, the, su- the sun very, very only goes down for about two hours, you know, a day. So, so we have about 20 plus hours of sunshine. And, and so it, it's warm. It's nice up there. In, in fact, this year they hit 90 degree temperature. In fact, we, we raced in Fairbanks, uh, one year, and they hit, and, and it was a record temperature. I think it was 90, it was in the 90s. I want to say 94 degrees, but it was 90 plus. It was very hot. And, and it was humid. So, no, Alaska, Alaska, three months, three, four months out of the year is, is, is very nice and comfortable, you know, to be in. So, what, what were some of your favorite tracks to race on? Oh, gosh. Well, I, I can tell you right off the bat, you know, Alaska Raceway Park, uh, uh, the way we were treated and, and, and everything. And, and, you know, racetrack's a racetrack. It's, it's the people that, and the fans that, that make it special. Uh, uh, the Firebird Raceway in Boise, Idaho. Um, Rocky Mountain Raceway in, in Salt Lake. They have always, you know, treated us good. Um, those, those, I gotta say, and, and, and Tucson. Tucson always treated us good and the fans were always good. It was, a, it was the temperatures that, uh, you know, we, we didn't like the air, but, but uh, Denver, you know, Bandamere, I'll tell you, that, that track is just, uh, I love that. It's the smoothest track uh, I've ever run on was Bandamere. And uh, I, I got to say, uh, the, the racetrack in White City, Oregon, just out of Medford, is a track that, uh, w- that we considered, you know, basically one of our home tracks. I say one of them. I live close to Fallon Top Gun, but uh, my wife's uncle uh, built that track, and I went out there and helped design it. I took a set of uh, blueprints that I had for a racetrack when um, the 188 acres was do- was donated to Jackson County by Pat Nixon when President Nixon was president, and uh, so as I was traveling through one year, he took me out and. And he, he was in charge of, of the park, and he said, do you think a drag strip would go well over here? And I said, yeah, there's nothing in Southern Oregon. And uh, he says, well, next time you come up, bring a set of blueprints, and let's go out there and see if we can set up a racetrack. And so we took the blueprints and set them on the ground and looked around 360 degrees and told him we need 4,000 feet. And I pointed in all directions, and he says, we don't have 4,000 feet that way, that way, that way, that way. And then I says, well, what about the mountain? How much? How far does your property go up the mountain? He says, all the way to the top of the tree line. 
and I took the blueprints and I turned them around, faced them towards the mountain. I said, find us, find us 4,000 feet, uh, 1,320 level feet, and shoot it up the mountain. And so he did, and so when he opened that track up, the opening day, I, I did a match race with their local alcohol drives because I was my double B funny car. And, and of course, you know, with all the family and friends there, you know, that, that's, we, we considered that our home track, you know, uh, Medford at, at, at the time, uh, it was called Southern Oregon Dragway. But, uh, then I, I can tell you that the track operators, uh, uh, when we went back, you know, to Cordova, uh, 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 Gardner, got a friend, I think it was named, uh, the, the track owner there just treated us just absolutely wonderful. You know, I mean, even at English Town, uh, uh, well, every, every, everywhere we've gone, we, you know, we've run all over the country and, uh, I can't say I've had a bad track. You know, they're, they're all good tracks. Of course, your local tracks and your local fans, you know, are, are, are your most favorite. But I gotta say, the Band of, the Band of Mirrors track, yeah. I love running that track. And see, I like running high altitude. You know, because I run my car so conservative, all I do when I go to, go to, uh, high altitude is throw a few more percent on nitrogen. And we ran at 9,400 corrected altitude feet. We ran a, a 611, a 235 there uh, a few years back. You know, which is, uh, you know, when, when I went down, you know, after we got everything loaded, I went down to pick up my, my paycheck and a sporty, you know, uh, Vandermeer and, and his dad, Junior, were there. And, and, you know, they complimented me on the pass. And they said, they said, we altitude corrected that pass because that was a, a, an incredible pass for a few altered at that corrected altitude feet. He said that would be a, a, a 663 at 261 miles an hour. And I said, wow, I said, that's awesome, but it means nothing to me without seeing it on paper. <laughs> I can't go brag about it. And, uh, but altitude, we, you know, the night we ran the first five in, uh, in Fallon, the top gun raceway, it was 8,400 corrected altitude feet. Uh, the night, it was 82, over 8,200 feet in Salt Lake when we were on the 578. So, you know, I'm not afraid of altitude. And my, and, and someone says, well, why don't you run fast at sea level? And it's because I back it off, you know. I, I keep my tuning band really wide. And I stay in that tuning band, and when I get to altitude, See, I, I, I have no computer on the car. You know, I, I don't run a computer. Everything is done with uh, with uh, looking at the spark plugs and looking at the rod bearing. Old style. Gart, Gart, Gart looks like that about me when I was working, you know, for him. Because I built the short blocks and, and maintained, you know, you know I, I was the diver at the races because they were my short blocks that I was building. And... Uh, we tuned from that. All right, so Ricky, what, what's the story behind uh, coming when you came c- coming up with the name the Nevada Rattler? Well, back uh, back when I was running my altered, you know, which was a dream car to me. Uh, that car, you know, we completed that car in 1969, so I called that car Fantasia 69. And uh, after I got in a construction accident. You know, and, and, and ripped my arm off, or my hand off my arm and was laying in the hospital. I wanted to go, I told my wife I was going to go funny car racing and I wanted to learn to fly. And she says, well, let's go funny car racing first. Of course, when she said that, she thought that I was still on a lot of drugs. But I, and, and I may have been. And, and so as, as I was laying in the hospital and I was thinking of all of those neat funny cars out there with the names on them. You know, I mean, every, you know, in the day, every funny car had a name on it. Right. You know, I, yeah, and, and, and the names, the names would just grab you. You know, I mean, I mean, the names of the cars, it was, it was named. And I said, you know, I gotta come up with a name for my funny car that will grab, you know, the average person. It's gotta sound tough. It's gotta sound mean, you know. 
and 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 I wanted to represent my state of Nevada. You know, I've lived in Nevada all my life. And I said, I've got to come up with a state with with a name with that includes my state. And then then I thought of of the fiercest creature, you know, in Nevada, in the desert, is a rattlesnake. And so I come up with the Nevada rattler, and uh, you know, had it every since. But I got to tell you a little story. Back in 1983, we 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 painted that's when Star Wars and everything came out. We repainted the car all these Star Wars colors and everything, and it was a beautiful car. And we changed the name to Star Rider, you know, because of of, of what was happening, you know, with with all the space, you know, shows and stuff. We went to a race uh, in Salt Lake, and uh, we got to run on the race and everything, and I came back home, and I listened, you know, uh, to the video that was being taped, and I heard the announcer, you know, uh, kind of disappointed that I changed the name on the car, and he said he's having a hard time, you know, calling me Star Rider and everything, and I, I heard that, and, and I thought about it, and I thought, you know, he's right. You can't build a name up, you know, the car and have a fan falling and then just change like that. And so we went back to the Nevada Rattler and, and stuck it out. You know, we, we knew better at that time. Great name, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. I'm, sh- I'm sure a lot of, a lot of fans didn't know how you came up with that name either. Well, you know, uh, back when we wanted to go racing, you know, do the East Coast, uh, uh, tour, you know, match racing, and and John Force helped me put that together. You know, I I, I spent a an afternoon at his house one year, early in the year when when he was putting his, his dates together, and he had offered to you know to help me and 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 turn me onto the to the tracks, you know, the contacts. He gave me the name of the of the track contact and everything, and I would call back, you know, to the to the East Coast, you know, I'd call. At Cologne, English Town, and I, I tell them who I was, you know, and and you know, it be kind of silent. They were they were waiting for me to continue, and I'd say, yeah, I have the Nevada Rattler Double A Fuel Funny Car, and they'd say, oh yeah, we've heard of you, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, I've never done anything really spectacular, but they've heard of the car, the Nevada Rattler, and and they all says, boy, we love getting West Coast cars out here to run our East Coast cars. And he said, Puts were a great show. And we really build it up. You know, West Coast is coming out to challenge the East Coast. And I was able to put, uh, you know, for the, for the summer, you know, for, for those three summer months, uh, uh, one heck of a tour, you know, of, of races, you know, back there. Right. And I, I, cre- I credit the name of Nevada Rattler. You know, nobody remembers who I was, but they remember who the, who the name of the car. That's funny. So now, you ready ready for some uh, fun questions before we close out this interview, Ricky? Sure. So now that, now that you don't drag race anymore, what kind of hobbies do you have? Well, you know, all those years I've kind of neglected our home and our property. I live on, on a little over an acre and stuff. And so I guess my hobby is, is giving back to my my home and my, my family and my wife. However, I have a lot of uh, a clientele of, of people. You know, in the off season when I wasn't racing, I was uh, working on street rods, building street rods, building cars for people. And so, since I stopped racing, I've had a ton of people want me to build them cars and stuff. And I'm just a little one man shop. My kids are grown and gone, got their lives, so I, I try and work at a real modest schedule working on on these uh nice little hot rods and stuff and uh work in my yard you know i mean just <laughs> I, I i'm you know most most husbands you know keep their yards all nice and groomed and that's what they do all the time well i was racing all the time so no i i reverted back to what most guys did when they were you know younger right so if you're if you're able to do time traveling and go back back in time, would you do anything differently with your racing career? You know, uh, that's an interesting question. 
I, I, I think everybody would, would say, gosh, if I had more money. But sometimes not having the money makes you do things and you learn on your own to do things that you, you would never, never do before. I don't think I would. I, I really don't think I would change anything. You know, I look back at my life and I reflect, you know, and of course, the, the problem with us racers is, is we want to compare ourselves to somebody that, that, that's better, you know, uh, uh, faster than a better driver, more might, whatever, you know. And uh, I look back at it and I think the, the financial situation that we worked through, you know, my wife and family, uh, the things that we did that really counted, you know, uh, I don't think you can buy that with money. So no, I, I wouldn't change anything. All right. You know? now, did, did you have Did you have a greatest competitor in uh, fuel altered racing? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. 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 The king. The, the king of our sport. Uh. Uh. Let's see. It's been like about. 11, 12 years ago now, he set the record for a fuel altar. And everybody, nobody liked to race him, I mean, because he would spank us. And, of course, he had one of the best tune-up guy, tune, tuners in the business with Amos Satterley. And he, he, was, he was my biggest competitor. And uh, uh, the other guy, you know, I raced a lot of guys that, that had a lot more power than me, and 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 were faster at times, but my car would go A to B, A to B, A to B, probably ninety five percent of the time. And so they would have to beat me. And what people don't understand when we're out there running, we're not running on an HRA national event level track, unless we go to Bandamir and uh, Salt Lake was too. You know, they're they're smaller tracks that. That would hold a, a, a full blown double A car. And then you've got these fuel alters that, that have these combinations that uh, you could run a double A fuel alter with. You know, uh, for example, take Jeff Deal that's out there on the, you know, running, running the tour, a part of the tour now, in tour. Well, he had the Witch Doctor double A fuel alter. And, um, awesome car, very fast, uh, car uh, the night that, that I had won the uh, that had won the championship the fuel altar championship in Boise the final round was against him and uh, he was a much faster car than me but he made the mistake of touching the cone in the center line and uh, so that gave me the championship most of the time the high powered cars struggled to go down there and so consequently we won most of the races but, but Amos Saturday could turn Ron Tazzle, you know, uh, down any one of those tracks. And in, in, uh, Salt Lake one night, or not Salt Lake, excuse me, in Denver, uh, he ran 286 miles an hour and the corrected altitude seat, I believe Amos told me was somewhere about 8,500, you know, right in that range of corrected altitude seat. He ran 286 miles an hour in that car. And, uh, you know, he, he ran a, uh, a five, well, well, in, in, in Oklahoma, he ran a 529 with the car. And then Tom Murphy here a couple years ago is the quickest fuel altered with a 528. And, uh, I, I always liked running Tom, you know, Tom's from, from the Midwest. You know, back there in Illinois. Yeah, Jurassic and, Plastic. Um, you know who he is, yeah, right? Yeah, Jurassic, <laughs> Jurassic Plastic. Yeah, he, he's a, he's a, that, that is a bad car, you know. I mean, uh, I love, I loved running with him and, and, uh, you know, there was, there was some days that I could spank him, but, uh, uh, I, I think those days are kind of past now the way he runs, but, uh, you know, uh, him and Mike Fazer, you know, Fazer. Oh, you yeah. Know, yeah, he drove the drastic. Uh, yep, I, I, I like running with all those guys out there. <clears throat> you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, uh, our, our biggest competitor, the guy that we always wanted to be, 
you know, was Ron Tazel and, and R.I.P. He's no longer with us, but uh, uh, him, and, him and Amos were, were the combination, you know, to be, in fact, in fact that, that, that mile an hour record's never been touched. And uh, with all, uh, all the uh, uh, power that these cars can put out, and, and I gotta say, you know, uh, Gary Bowden's got out of Fairbanks with the last Grizzly car. See, see, I was I was in one lane one night, one day. Well, it could be night. The sun was still out, probably ten o'clock at night. And and I and I was motoring on a, on a pretty good path. I'd, I'd run a a, a five ninety at, at two hundred and forty four miles an hour. And at about uh, eleven hundred feet, that car shot out like an afterburner on a car and just boom. Well, I saw it go two hundred and seventy nine miles an hour. You know, and, and they've run in, in the 540s too with that car. And I really got to hand it to uh, Gary up there because, you know, he's not around all of this high tech stuff. You know, his, his learning comes from his racing stuff and, and uh, he can really put some big numbers down with that car. And he, he was, of course, you know, when we went up, you got some pretty tough questions. I don't, you know, I don't, think I've ever been embarrassed on the track. I, I, I can say disappointed because I may have let my crew of fans down and and obviously a disappointing uh, one night uh, one night in Boise when I made my first five second pass and the fuel altered. Uh, oh no, it was the next day. Uh, I, 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 made, I made a five second pass in the evening and qualifying we came back in the next day in the heat of the day, 100 plus degrees. I ran a, uh, a 598, 244, and on a red light. And uh, that was, I wasn't embarrassed. I was disappointed, you know, in that. And and it was against the uh, uh, Sullivan and Hate car. You know, they were, they were big competitors of, of mine, too. Gosh, you know, there were so many good cars out there. But uh, running, running them, uh, they they had uh, some serious horsepower. Uh, in fact, I seen they, they set the track mile an hour record at two seventy five in Boise one day, and uh, uh, I ended up beating them in the final. You know because they couldn't put it back to back. You know with all that management system. You know the fuel altered. Uh, you know, let, Dave, let me explain this to you so you really get a, get a good view of it. You know, we used to travel around and carry the fuel altered body in the, in the trailer. And, and, and we could run either car or some, at, at, at the racetrack. And so sometimes you run the funny car, sometimes you run the fuel altered at, at the same event. And, and the fuel altered, even though it was, it was the same car, when you fight it, you get in the fuel altered and all of a sudden, you're looking down there, you got nothing to go by. You know, and you think, whoa, you know, this is a little bit frightening, you know, and all of a sudden it becomes much more of a challenging car to drive, even though it's not as fast, and uh, and you can see better. Maybe you can see too good sometimes. So uh, uh, the, the fuel altered is much more exciting to drive than a funny car. For, mainly for those reasons, and much more difficult to drive. You know, now if you had a Fiat body or something, you'd still have you know something to register with. But most of the cars are roadsters. All right, now you an- you answered a difficult question. I'll give you a couple easy questions now. What what's your uh, what's your favorite food to eat? My favorite food, uh, Mexican food. Yeah, you think you say you like spaghetti? You like spaghetti too, right? Oh, I love spaghetti. Well, my, well Italian's my second favorite. The problem is, 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 is Italian food has more carbohydrates than Mexican food. And 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 me at six, at, at five foot six, you know, we have to kind of trim some of the carbs. But yes, yes, I could live off of uh, Italian food uh, just as well. Italian or Mexican, you know. So, what's your favorite food that your wife cooks? Uh, 
when she cooks uh, well spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Italian food. Yeah, she. You know, and and all you, you know what she would do is uh, you know because we fed so many people at, at the racetrack. What she would do is she would cook up you know big pots of spaghetti sauce, put them in Ziploc bags, and then freeze them. And then we'd go to the track and and uh, you know we would we would uh, heat it up. You know, stop out and and we'd have spaghetti. We'd we'd feed. 60, 70 people, you know, we, we always made sure that, that any crews that were close to us, if, uh, if they weren't getting a warm meal or something, we'd invite them over for spaghetti too, you know, right. because we know that a lot of, a lot of the crews didn't have, have anyone there to cook for them or the facility. Yep. You know, I've always had living quarters on, on everything I've had, you know, to go racing once, once I got married. And so we could always have a hot meal. I remember in, in, in uh, Salt Lake one year, uh, we were at a national event, and and we were in line, and, and my wife was cooking bacon and, and eggs and making toast and stuff, and the late John Collins come by with a donut in his hand and, and smelled that bacon coming out of the windows of the camper and just stopped there, and, and, and he looked at my daughter, you know, my daughter, and he says, is that bacon I smell? And she says, yes. And she says, gosh, what would it take to get a slice of bacon? And and she was, uh, she was a teenager then, and you know, John was a pretty good looking man, so she ran in and she grabbed a couple pieces of bacon and brought them out to him, to John, you know, like they say, the, the, the memories and the experiences, you know. Yep. All right, so next question, Ricky, what's your favorite beverage to drink? Well, besides water, <laughs> uh, I do like to indulge in a diet coke from time to time with a squeeze lemon. You know, I, I, I'm not, uh, uh, back in 1980, oh, I went full time racing in 1978. In 1980, I basically stopped drinking. And, um, uh, not because the alcohol gave me a buzz or anything, but I just, uh, got lazy, you know. The next day, if I if I if I drank too much beer or anything, I don't want want to do anything but be a couch potato. So I I'd say I diet coke with a squeeze lemon. All right. So this this last question, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get political on you. What do you think about President Trump? I love him. You know uh, what what he's what he's done for the country. You know the turnaround, and I can tell you firsthand. I I I when when uh, our last president. Was and uh, I lost over over $100,000 in sponsorship uh, during his term because a lot of my people were going out of business and stuff, you know. I mean, it, the economy was so bad at that time. And mm-hmm. so it, it really cost, cost, you know, it hurt all of my sponsors, a lot of my sponsors. Um, you know, I mean, I don't like to get political, uh, a good one that has been in business for decades that sponsored me was Charles and Abby. You know, that's a name that you probably heard, you know, almost mm-hmm. all your late career. And uh, he couldn't survive the economy back then. So Trump has done a ma- magnificent job for our economy, you know. Make America yep. great again. Make America great again. And he's done it. I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I am proud. I am very proud of our president, you know, today and what he's done. And a lot of people judge, you know, his character and stuff. I said, I didn't elect him for his character. I elected him to, 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 to take care of our country. He's a patriot. How many, you know, how many people, you know, would, how many billionaires would sacrifice that kind of a lifestyle to come in and, and take the torment that he does from, from the opposing party? You know, I mean, he doesn't have to take that. I mean, why exactly. would you? Why would you do that? And 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 then do such. You know, can you imagine what what he could do if they were in if they supported him? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All that all that he's done in a short time. That Obama was in there eight years. He didn't do nothing. Well, yeah, you, you know. I, I hear I hear 
president coming in making excuses about trying to clean up the mess of the last president. I mean, for eight years, Obama was blaming Bush for everything that was going bad, and and the the country was in a tailspin. You know, Glenn and I mean, I, I I can't tell you how much. You know, two of my children lost their homes. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, it was devastating times. And uh, you know, then then uh, uh, Trump becomes president, and two and a half years, he's cleaned up. Uh, probably 80% of the mess that, that Obama made and uh, he could finish if they would uh, cooperate with him. You know, I don't, I don't know how the man does it, you know, uh, personally. He is he's Superman in my book. Exactly, yeah. When, like you said, like you said, it was one of other presidents within their, in there, they always supported them, but Trump, they are, they're all against him. They want to, they want to impeach him and all that crap. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look what he has to put up with, and 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 and, and it, you know, none of that bothers him. You know, uh, well, I, I don't think they're used to anybody fighting. You know, back. But, you know, when you got a president that does as much in a short period of time as as he's done, you know, he's a fighter. Yeah, they and, they, don't, they don't like that he's not one of them. No, well, well, you know, and 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 you know, he's a fighter for us. He's a fighter for the American people. He's a fighter for the you know, for us, that's that's what uh, makes me love him. Oh yeah, and, he, and he, he's going to expose a lot of these evil Democrats, so they're scared of that. Well, you know, that's the biggest thing he did was really expose them. And boy, I'll tell you what, uh, we all this stuff we wouldn't have learned, would have known about. You know, if if well, you know what, if they would have just kept their mouth shut and gone along with them, we probably still wouldn't know about it. They're, they're their own worst enemy. Yep. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you one more question and go back to drag racing now. Um, what's your uh, greatest, fondest memory of your whole drag racing career, Ricky? You know, my fondest memory is my first quarter mile pass in my little seventeen second Model A coupe with a flathead. And going down there, that first pass, and shutting off in the shut-off area, uh, that, that's, that's my fondest memory, you know, remembering that pass and, and telling everybody that I was going to be a drag racer when I got out of high school. I was going to be a drag racer. And nobody was hardly making a living at it back in 1961, especially, see, I, you know, I, I grew up in a mining town. You know that that had a a population of a few hundred uh, people. I I know in my eighth grade graduating class there was five of us. Then I went to high school in a small town. There was forty four people in my graduating class. Population was two thousand people, and uh, me and me and one other kid had the only hot rods in town. And uh, you know, and and here I'm boasting about when I grow up I'm going to be a drag racer, you know, I'm going to make my living drag racing. And I went back to my uh, 50th high school class reunion, and uh, I, I got an award, you know, uh, I was in, I was in uh, the high school hall of fame, you know, I was honored with, with that and, and, and a, a wonderful plaque and, and I, I, you know, just kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm in the Persian County hall of fame. And uh, I thought, wow, what a compliment that was that uh, so many of the people that, that laughed at me, you know, of course, most of them are gone, but, uh, you know, some were still there and laughed at me and made fun of me and thought I was crazy for putting all my money into this old piece of junk, you know, which uh, it was considered then. Today, 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 they've made a class, street class out of those called Rat Rock. You know, that's really popular. But, but in, in the day, in the day, you know, my, my stuff was, uh, it was basically unsafe. But I can tell you this day, they were all fast. <laughs> yeah, you, know? you, you pursued your dreams. Yep, and, and, and as, as we traveled around, one of the most rewarding things we did, Dave, is, is 
we did a little project called Racing for Kids, and uh, we would we would do fundraisers and stuff, and and all the money would go back to you know some of the uh, un, unfunded state children's homes and stuff of that nature, and then we'd go to the hospitals, and we'd take uh, a bag of Hot Wheels in there, and then I would take uh, decals from my sponsors and. And, and pictures, hand out flyers to the kids, and we'd visit the kids in the hospitals. And, um, you know, just give them Hot Wheels and, and pictures and stuff like that. And that's probably one of the most rewarding things uh, I have to give back to my drag racing career because it, it, it taught me uh, how fortunate I was and how unfortunate a lot of these, these children are. And, and uh, I always wrote on their posters, you know, live, their, live your dream. And uh, even spoke at, at a few places where there were, were, were I, I want to say, orphaned kids, you know, a lot of them were teenagers and stuff. And uh, it was a place for them to survive and get a meal, place, place to sleep. And didn't really have any direction. And I, I would speak to them and you know, say, hey, you know, live your dream, live your dream, you know, every, everything that you, if, if you want something, you have to go work for it, you know, right. uh, just know, just know that nobody's going to give you anything, and I'm not saying nobody will, but in your, your mind, just know that if you want something, you have to do it on your own, and don't let anybody stop you, because, uh, or detour you, because I can't tell you how many people told me that I was crazy and I was wasting my money and it wasn't going to happen. And, you know, in the early days, you know, I was not a good racer. I lost more times than I won. You know, I mean, many more times than I won. And everybody thought, you know, it's easy to criticize from the stand, you know, well, you know, he doesn't have it. He's not good stuff. That never detoured me, you know, because it was all about my family and me and what we were doing had nothing to do with, with who I was racing that, that had a better car faster or could beat me. It wasn't about that. It, it, the experience, you know, of, of, of being there, right. you know, being a you know, being part of it, you know, even if you're a small part of it. So that, that's, that's beautiful, Ricky. Well, I want to thank you very much for uh, you doing this interview tonight. Well, I want to thank you, Dave. I'm honored, you know, to be to be uh, called upon, you know, some of the great races that you have, you know, on here. So thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Oh, you're welcome. It was great hearing all the old stories. Well, well, Dave, if, if, if you will message me your address, 